can turn your Bibles to John chapter 4 today. Um, we're starting a brand new series today. I'm excited for that. Yep, I am excited. Be worship for the next four weeks. We're going to be digging into this new topic. Last last week we uh, we did a little. Me and my wife did a little tag team preaching. How many of you think she just did an incredible job last week? Then she brought a word yesterday. And girl, you look fine doing it too. I'm just saying, you look fine while you was preaching. I can say that. And. Um, but, man, I am, I am so, uh, so pumped up to start this series. I'm giving you some time to turn to John chapter 4. And then we're going to start knocking this word. Because it's cool. You know, we, we just started this. We did this series last called This Is Me. And we started working on becoming the best me, right? And, uh, and it was such a, I think it was a cool series as we learned to walk in who God created us to be. But I think that the next topic for us to tackle in is this worship topic just because now that we're learning to be the best me, we need to learn how to live a life of worship. And I think it's going to help us and help some of you and help me as well get deeper into our understanding of what God wants from us and calls us into this worship. So John chapter 4, I'm going to start in verse 16. I've actually preached from this passage a few weeks ago. Uh, the woman in the, uh, the Jesus, when Jesus meets the lady at the well, and she was a Sumerian woman, he was a Jew, and they weren't supposed to talk to one another, right? She was the one that Jesus confronts her, and he's like, hey, uh, why don't you go get your husband to come back? And, she, uh, and he's like, I, or I don't have a husband. He's like, that's right, you've had five husbands, right? He tells her that, and, and, um, and she's, like, she's like, how do you know everything? And, and he, oh, because you must be a prophet and all this. So we talked about this story not too long ago about this thing, but it, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to I'm going to hit it from a different angle today because there's something that I didn't go over whenever I did go do this story about worship that Jesus actually talks to her about. So verse 16 is going to be kind of the, the ending of this story. And it says, Jesus said to the Sumerian woman, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one you now have is not your husband what you have said is true. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is this place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, I don't think you should address them. Maybe you could address a woman back then like that. I don't think some of you would like it if I looked at you and was like, Woman, right? My wife would be like, What are you talking about? Jesus, <laughs> Jesus was just so bold, you know? It's like, Woman. Believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. And God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. I know this is a four-week series, but this message in particular is going to be a two-part message. And you can title this if you're taking notes, which I hope that you are. Becoming a true worshiper, part one. Becoming a true worshiper, part one. You see, I'm, I think one of the reasons I'm so excited about starting this series with you guys and with our church is because, you know, I believe with where our church is headed, this series is going to be crucial for us as a church to grow spiritually. We can grow spiritually from it as we understand more of this concept of worship. You see, when you're a church as early as we are, as young as we are, not young in age, we have all age groups that come here, which is awesome, you know. Uh, but when I'm talking about like a year and a half old, you know, it's, it's very um, important that our leadership team sets a, sets a culture, you know. We have to set a certain standard, a certain culture in here and build into that. And one of the cultures I've been thinking about is, you know, uh, you know, the biggest thing that I want when people come through the doors is that they feel valued, that they feel loved, that they feel important, that they feel like they matter because people matter, amen. Uh, and once they get here, it's that you feel that, because God is love, they should feel that from other people, right? And so once they get, once we all get here in this place and you're feeling that presence, we should then be excited to step into worship. We should be excited to worship him, to give him praise, to shout his name. You know, we should get excited for that. And that's where we, we come up with this phrase where church should be enjoyed, not endured, right? 
Because for a long time, a lot of us have gone, grown up or gone to church where it was just like a mark off the to-do list. You know, it's like, I went to church, I'm going a, I'm to a mark this off, it's off my to-do list, I'm a good person. You know, not much deeper than that. But God, man, God wants so much more from you. He doesn't want this to just be something you check off your to-do list for the week. Man, he wants a relationship with you. He wants you to come into worship with him. And I think through the next four weeks as we begin unwrapping, you know, what worship is, like Jesus told this woman, it's time for the true worshipers to come up. I believe that we're going to build a culture of people who are true worshipers, who are worshiping in spirit and in truth. You see, I grew up, though, I'm going to tell you how I grew up understanding worship. See, I was fortunate enough in, uh, that my parents, you know, went to church and stuff, and so I grew up in a church environment. But I always thought worship was when the band plugged in and they started playing and we got to start singing songs, right? That's how I always grew up. I mean, it's called worship music, isn't it? So when I came into church, I was thinking, this is the worship segment. This is the word. You know, then we do our offering. We do all, you know, it's like segments. But this right here, the, the 30 minutes of singing songs, that's worship. And that's how the concept I grew up with. And many of us grow up with that concept that the worship is exactly that. It's what you come into these doors and it's when you sing the songs that are on the screen with the band. And then whenever that's done, worship's done. But worship is so much more than just singing songs. It's so much more than just coming. This, the, the, we, that's why we call our entire, uh, we don't usually, we try to get to this point where we don't call it a service, you know, a church service, but we call it a worship experience. Because not just the, when the band plays is it worship. Man, worship is happening all the time. It should happen all the time. And it shouldn't just happen on Sunday. It should happen on your Monday through Saturday. Worship is a style of life. It's a lifestyle. And that's how I grew up understanding what worship is. And maybe some of us grew up knowing what worship is. But that, that concept, what is worship, right? The English root word that it derives from is worth-ship, which means to give something value, to give something worth. You know, when you worship something, you give something value, you give something worth. You, you're, uh, you're giving adoration to it, right? And I want to start off by say, saying something to you right here, right? You were created to worship. You were created to worship. Now, what you worship is up to you. You were created to worship. That's why each and every, whether you're an atheist, whether you don't believe in God, or whether you do believe in God, guess what? You were created to worship. You have some sense in you that's going to give value and worth to something in your life, whatever is there. We always give it. We all give value or worth to something in our lives. It's because we're created to worship. And since we're created to worship, we're going to worship whatever at the forefront of our lives. It's a priority thing. So if God's a priority in your life, guess what? You're going to live a life of worship. If he's not a priority in your life, then you're going to find yourself worshiping other things. And not in the sense of, like, oh, my, I'm bowing down to football. But, for example, right, you can have this guy. You know, you always see him on TV, the, the dude that's, like, just jacked, you know, with his face painted in gold and black at the front of the Mercedes-Benz Dome, just yelling at the top of his lungs for the Saints to win, right? Like, who that? Who that? He's just hollering, you know, and he doesn't care. Who sees him? He wants to be seen on TV acting like a fool. Like, come on, come on. Like, what he's doing is he's giving worth, he's giving value to the team. In a sense, he's worshiping. Now, and I'm, like I said, I'm not talking about like, oh, I'm bowing down. No, but he's giving them worth, he's giving them value. The same thing can happen is say you work an 80 hour week, right? Your kids are growing up and your wife is there, but you're working an 80 hour week because you're after power, you're after success, you're after money, and so you put your priority on your career, and guess what? Now you're worshiping your career. You're worshiping your work. You're worshiping your job because you're giving it worth. You're giving it value. You're giving it all your time. You see, we're all created to worship. Relationships can be one. You can jump from relationship to relationship to relationship, giving every person every ounce of your worth, of your value, of your time, worshiping them in a sense only to be let down again and be in another relationship. You know, it, it happens. It's what we put at the forefront of our lives because we're created to worship. But you weren't just created to worship. You were created to worship him. 
And that's why, you know, with the devil and, and sin and all of that come into this world, that's why it gets so mixed up because we're selfish in nature. We're selfish in nature. And because we're selfish in nature, sometimes our priorities are jacked up. And because our priorities are jacked up, we don't quite see how we were created to, we were created to worship, but it's just not a priority to worship him. Jesus is having this conversation with this woman at this well in John chapter 4. And he's trying to tell her, because if you see her response, right, he says, she says in verse, um, what is it, verse 18, I think, or no, 19. She said, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. So already in her mind, she thinks worship's a place, not a person, not who we are. She thinks I have to go somewhere in order to worship, right? And, and she's like, I have to go somewhere. And Jesus is trying to tell her different. So you don't have to go there. There's a time coming where the veil, when I die on the cross, the veil is going to tear. I'm going to be everywhere. You can worship right where you are. In spirit and in truth, you can worship. And Jesus was trying to show her relationship because he was like, but you keep jumping from relationship to relationship to relationship, wasting all your time, all your energy, all your effort on things that are only going to be temporary because they're at the priority of your list. If you would learn to get your priorities right and put me first, become a true worship, worship in spirit and truth, then you'll find fulfillment in everything else in your life. When Jesus is number one, everything else changes. It simply does. It changes. It's a priority thing. A true worshiper learns how to worship God, the Father in spirit and in truth. They like that. They think it's good. I know that's some good preaching right there. <laughs> Pumped up in here. Yeah. You see, you see, I started understanding, though, the more I started understanding about worship and the more I started understanding, you know, that it wasn't just when we sing the songs and stuff, I started realizing, I started recognizing something, especially studying God's word. You start recognizing that there's an inner essence to worship, like an inner essence to worship, and there's an external expression of worship, right? There's the inner essence and the external expression of worship. That's why this, this, this message in particular is going to be a two-part message, because I can't cover it all in one day. I'm going to cover mess, the rest of it next week, but this week, I want you to, to catch that there's a, there's a distinction between the inner essence of worship and your external expression of worship. Jesus actually made the distinction first. Jesus said in Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9, he says, This people, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain, they do worship me. You see, look at this. Look at this for a second. I'm going to show you where the, distinc the distinction's made, right? The people, when he says honor me with their lips, he's talking about an external expression of worship. You know, singing, lifting up God's name with voice. But he says, but their heart... Their heart's far from me. Now he's talking about the inner essence, right? He says, before you can ever get it right here, you got to get it right here. Before you can ever truly learn and be fulfilled by worship in your life, before you can just be someone who expresses it, oh, I go to church. You can go to church and not truly worship. You can pray at your house and not truly worship. You can go your day by day and not truly worship because if it's not right here, it's not going to be right here. It's just going to be words. So that's what I want to zone in on today. I want to zone in on this inner essence of worship. You know, getting your heart right because worship comes from the heart. It comes from your heart. It's just like the proverb says, whatever you put in your heart, the mouth what? Speaks, right? So worship comes from the heart. And before we can learn these expressions of worship, which next week is going to be fun, you don't want to miss it. We really want to, I really want to zone in on learning what it means to worship in spirit and in truth. Worshiping from the heart. Worshiping from the heart. So how do we worship in spirit and truth? What is Jesus talking about? What is he, when he's talking to this lady at the woman, this woman at the well, what is he talking about? Well, first I want you to know that worship is about God, not us. Worship is a, it's about God, not us. And some of you are like, well, duh. That's the easiest point you ever gave me in my life. You know, even though it's the easiest point, 
I probably ever gave, it's the hardest one to follow, I think. Watch me break this down for you and watch, watch me show because it's, it's so easy to get this down, but yet it seems so basic. Of course, worship's about God, right? Of course, I come to church to worship him. Of course, I pray at my house to worship him. Of course, I obey him and I take a step of faith to what? To worship him. Of course I do that. I mean, that's, that's a no-brainer. You see, I think where we mess up on this point is, we be, we, is when we begin to dictate how worship has to happen for us. How it has to happen for us. See, it's so interesting to me. I, guys, I'm going to tell you from, it's happened to me before, okay? I am guilty of this, and if I'm guilty of this, I know you are too. So you ain't leaving me here, right? I remember going into a, a, a worship service one time and being like, oh, I'm so ready to worship. And the first song come on, and it's like one of my favorite songs. I'm like, this is my jam, and I'm like all into it, right? And then they play the second song, and it's like my least favorite song. And I'm like, oh, I can't worship to this. Man, this song ain't no good. And so, like, I just sit and wait till it's over. And then the next song comes on. And, and then I'm like, oh, that, that's better. That's better. I can worship now. But how many of us have probably done that before, right? It's like, oh, I don't know the words to this. It's not like we put it on the screen for you or anything. You know, I don't know the words. I can't worship at all. You see, it's, it's crazy. It, it, that could be one or, or, or another. It, it's so interesting. It's like, I, I'm just in a bad mood today. I can't worship. I've had a bad day. I'm just not, not worshiping at all. Like, I'm coming over here, and I'm going to be here, or I'm going to get ready to. Oh, I had this whole plan to pray at, at, at my home today. I was going to get home. I was going to pray. But that guy, my coworker, he just made me so mad today, and I don't need to pray with this kind of heart. I'm just, I'm not worshiping today. I'm not even in the mind for it. Don't even have the right mood to do that. Or, or you know, I just, I, I, my life, you guys, you, you got to understand. I get it. Look, I'm not about to condemn anybody. I get that life gets busy sometimes. I get that life gets really busy, and sometimes you're going to go out of town, and sometimes you're going to not be around, and, and church is hard to make. I do get it, right? But I did the math this week, and I realized that how many hours are in a week? Tell me this. How many hours are in a week? Is that 168, right? 168 hours in a week. Most church services will last about 90 minutes, right? About 90 minutes. And, and I started thinking to myself, man, see, if we could get to the place where we could give God 90 minutes of our week, 90 minutes of, an, of 168 hours, man, when, when you don't have anything going on, I get it. When you're busy and you got something, that might happen. Maybe, maybe there aren't great excuses, but you get busy sometimes. But what I'm trying to say is that, man, God wants to speak to you. He wants a life of worship. But so many times we're like, I'm just so busy. Well, because worship's about us. It's not about him. When worship's about us, we worship on our schedule, when we're in the right mood, and if the song is right for us, we start getting It's because we're selfish in nature. That's just how we were created. We were created to, to be like that. And for some of us today, the biggest breakthrough that you could have in your life it's just realizing that worship's about God. Aligning your priorities to realize that he's number one. That if I'm going to worship in spirit and truth, then I've got to get my priorities straight. I've got to realize that even if it's a song I don't like or I don't know, the words are up here, and I'm going to declare them because they're going to be life-giving and they're going to speak over my life. That when I'm at my house and I'm having a bad day, that's the best day to pray. So I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to ask God to come into my room into my pres and, and get into his presence and ask him to, to lead me, to help me take a step. You know, it's those times that worship, guys, worship is not about us. It's about him. It's about who he is, and that's why it comes to this truth, right? Because before you can really ever worship God, you have to understand him in truth. What I mean by that is understanding him in truth is you've got to understand who he is, what he's done for you. I'm going to get kind of theological for you because I like to do that, right? <laughs> Worship is about who he is. Well, let's talk about who he is. There's these three really cool terms that describe something, the essence of God, right? One is God is omnipresent. He's omnipresent, meaning that he's everywhere all the time. 
He's God. He's everywhere all the time. Jeremiah 23, 23 and 24 says, I am God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away. Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord. Do I not feel heaven and earth, declares the Lord. He's, he, I mean, I love, a lot of times if you read the Old Testament, it's like Jesus is so sarcastic. It's so funny. He's like, ain't I the person who's everywhere all the time? I'm all over the place. You can worship me anywhere because I'm everywhere. I'm omnipresent. I created everything. My presence is everywhere. It's everywhere. I love Psalm 139. This might really encourage somebody in here today. Psalm 139, verses 7 through 10. It says, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, meaning death, meaning, uh, oh, you went, can you go back there? Sheol, you are there. Go back. Now you can go to the next place. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. I, it's cool what, what David's saying. is like, no matter where I go, guess what? God, you're everywhere. And that should be encouraging for you and should make you want to worship. Because even when you're in the low places, guess what? He's there. Even when you're in the valley, he's there. Even when you're on top of the mountain, he's there. Even when you're climbing the mountain, in the middle, he's there. He's always there. He's omnipresent. You can worship him in your shower. You can worship him in your bed. You can worship him at church. You can worship him on the road. God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. Knowing him in truth. Another one is God is omniscient. He's omniscient. This means he know, he's all-knowing. He's all-knowing, right? Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 says, Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other God. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. He says, I know everything. I created it all. I know how many hairs are on the top of your head, the Bible says. He know, I, I know every. He's all-knowing. He created the, I mean, he created the universe. And he's, the coolest thing about getting on, on the team, on God's team, is guess what? You know the person who wrote the end of the book and the beginning of the book. So no matter what, where you're at in life, you know that at the end of the day, guess what? You win because God wins at the end of the day. As long as you're on his team, you're going to win. He's omniscient. and he, he's all-knowing. That's what Psalm 139.4 says, Before a word is on my tongue, God, you know it completely, O Lord. Before you even speak something, God already knows you're going to say something. Before you even cuss that person out for cutting you off in New Orleans traffic, he already knows what you're about to say, right? Before you even give somebody encouraging words, he knows what's you, on your heart. God knows the motives of your heart. And the inner essence of worship starts here. In your heart, he's omnipresent, he's omniscient, and God is omnipotent. God is omnipotent, that means he's, he's all-powerful. He's all-powerful. Job 37, 23 says, the Almighty is beyond our reach, and he's exalted in power in his justice and great righteousness. He does not oppress, and he's all-powerful. He's so powerful that all he had to do was speak, and a universe came into existence. He's so powerful that all he had to do was take a Lunchable and he feed 5,000 people with it. He's so powerful that he can make his body go into zero gravity and walk on water. Man, this is all powerful. God is omnipotent. I understand, so I understand that I'm worshiping a God who knows my every need, He's everywhere anytime I need him, and he's more powerful than any situation I could ever go through. That's the God that I'm worshiping. That's the God that I get to serve. That's the God that you are on a team with. That's why I worship him in truth, and the biggest reason I worship him in truth is because of the gospel, right? It's because of salvation and what he sent his son on this earth to do for us. Paul said it best in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. God is so powerful that all he had to do was beat death. And because he beat death, we never have to worry about being dead forever because we're going to be living everlasting eternally with Jesus for all those who believe in him. 
Man, I think that's so encouraging to me because, man, I'm worshiping in truth. I'm worshiping the fact that he is omnipotent, he's omniscient, he's omnipresent, and he saved my life. That's worshiping in truth. That's a reason to worship him. That's a reason to live a life of worship, to not just come on Sundays and say, this is my worship, but on my Monday to make sure I'm praying, on my Tuesday to grab my spouse's hands and pray with their together. On my Wednesday, if you find a place to worship or you put some music on, every day of the week is what I'm trying to get to is, I, is a lifestyle of worship. It's living worship. It's giving God that moment in your life where it's just like, when I understand this truth, I'll begin to see my heart change in a way it's never changed before. I'll begin to see myself grow closer with God than I've never seen before because I'm stepping into worshiping him. I realize that worship is about God. It's about who he is and what he's done for me. That's worshiping in truth. And now that I'm, I know it, now I'm knowing what I, what, who I'm worshiping, I can start understanding my, my, how knowing him, he will now take our spirit and empower it to worship, right? God is love. It's the same power that rose Jesus from the grave. It's the same power that lives inside of you. The word, when you're worshiping him, he's empowering your spirit. But he can't empower your spirit if you don't do one thing. And this is my, my last point for you, Z, is that true worship has to give God our full attention. See, true worship has to give God our, our full attention. You see, when we worship God and we thank him for everything he's given us and we worship all-powerful, almighty God, when we're worshiping him, it begins to build a relationship with him. It's no longer, when you come here and you actually believe in your heart what you're singing on these words on the screen, what you, when you actually believe in your heart what you're praying at your house, man, it starts to change you. You start to actually experience intimacy with God. It no longer becomes a check off your to-do list. It no longer becomes a moment where, oh, this is just something I have to do and I'm enduring it. No longer is it that anymore. Now you're experiencing a relationship with God, and because you're experiencing a relationship with God, it's going to change everything in your life. You're going to realize how your kids are going to grow up in a better home than they could have ever grown up in because God's your foundation. Now you're worshiping him. You're moving into him. But to give him, to, to really build that relationship with him in spirit and empower your spirit, you've got to be able to give your attention to him. And a lot of this world is ADHD, right? It's so hard to keep our attention on something nowadays, to keep our attention. You know, really, it says for, for youth pastors, they have it worse than, than I do, but they say youth pastors for the youth, like you, you basically, if you're preaching a 35-minute message or so, they probably heard 10 minutes of it because <laughs> they're thinking of other things throughout the sermon, right? Because it's just our mind. It's hard to give a t that, that, that full attention but giving our attention is such a simple and powerful tool to building a strong relationship with God. That's the hard part, though, right? Giving God our, our full attention. It's just like in your lifestyle, giving attention, man, it, it, it can change things in, in your family life. I was talking to one of my best friends that lives in Kansas City. He recently uh, got married to a, a woman who had a, uh, a little five-year-old and as well as was had his, he just had his first child, right? So he's got a, a newborn, he's got a, fi a five-year-old. And he was like, man, Ryan, I had to have a heart check not too long ago. And I was like, what, man, what you talking about? Like, what, what's going on? He's like, I, he's like, really, I'm thankful for the wife that I have because, you know, I would get home from work and I'd be tired and I'd sit down on the couch and I'd just get into Facebook and I'd just start giving my phone all my attention. And my kids are sitting there trying to play with me or, and I have a newborn that I need to take care of, but I'm spending hours on social media and I'm not giving any attention to them. So he's like, dude, you might not see me on social media for a while because it's more important that I give them my attention than my phone my attention. And I was like, wow, that's, that's, that's powerful. You know, that he, and I'm glad he's realizing that at, a, at, at the, the start of what they're doing because it's going to help them build. The more attention he gives his family, the more attention he gives his spouse, the stronger that relationship's going to be. The moment you start giving your attention to other things, right, it starts to to kind of fall more apart because they don't seem like a priority in your life. The same thing with Jesus. Then you got to be able to give God your attention. You got to be able to give God your attention in order to build a strong relationship with him. Because so many times I feel like we don't give God the value and the worth he deserves because he's not the forefront of our lives. 
and it's so easy to barely give him any attention. It's like, man, I, I find myself so convicted that through my week, I'm like, you know, I give other things in my life way more attention than I give God. You know, I might come to church and give him 90 minutes of my attention, but do I give him attention my Monday through Saturday? I'm not telling you that every day, all day, you need to be thinking God. You got kids that you need to grow up. I'm thinking, man, how many of us go to bed at night and we're like, oh, I'm so tired. I want to pray tonight, but I just I can't pray tonight or I can't pray for my family, so I'm just going to go lay in bed. And then you go lay in bed and get on Facebook for 20 minutes before you fall asleep. So Right? And you're telling me you can't give God 10 minutes of that 20 minutes to just pray to him and thank him for the day you've had, to thank him, to, to grab your family's hand and pray with them. You know, recently I just started doing, me and Leah started doing a devotion together because I felt convicted about that attention thing. It's crazy how God will convict a, a pastor's heart too when you start preparing for a sermon sometimes. And I was like, man, I, I'm convicted. And it, I've realized just how much stronger we can be together when we just take 10 minutes of our nights just to grab each other's hand and say a prayer together and do a devotion together. When we give God our attention, man, it changes things entirely. When you come in church, man, so many times we can come in church and we can sit here and we'll be like singing the song and you're like, oh, what am I going to eat after service today? <laughs> man, you just heard your stomach growl and you're like, oh, I can... Maybe I'm going to go hit up some Tokyo Grill or something. I like that place a lot. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, you just start thinking about other things or what do I have to do when I get home today? It's like even hard for us to get here and give God just 90 minutes of our attention, right? Where God, God, you might be thinking about what you want to do tomorrow and God might be thinking about what he wants to do in your life right now. If we would give him our attention, then he would be able to speak to us, but he can't speak to us if you're not giving him your attention. It's during the week, it's praying. Those, those moments matter when you give him your attention. I realized how I was being convicted about that. It's almost like this. I remember one time having a conversation with Leah. Or we were, like, sitting down talking one time, and she was telling me something. And, and granted, we're guys, so sometimes we lose, you know, attention. And she's talking to me, Jason. And she's, she's just chatting, and I wasn't there. I was there, but I wasn't there, right? <laughs> and she looks at me and like, you're here but you're not here, right? How many guys have ever gotten that before? You're here, but you're not here, right? It, it, it's, it's a guy thing. But I realized that, man, that's so, that same concept right there can transfer over to the church world. Or how many times we're here, but we're not really here. We're sitting here, but we're not really here, you know, because God is wanting to speak something into your life. He's wanting to share something in your life, but he can't because we're not really here. We're thinking about other things in our situations and things like that. And Matthew, I, I don't really usually read from the paraphrase version too often. Uh, there's, a, there's a Bible translation called the message that's a paraphrase. But it said verse 34 of Matthew 6 so well that I had to bring it in. It said, give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the times come. We so worry about what's going to come. I think about what's about to happen, what the future is going to happen, instead of just letting God speak to us right here, right now, where we're at. Man, God wants to share a word with you, but he can't share a word with you if you aren't opening up your mind, if you're not giving him attention. He's not going to be able to do those things. He might not be able to speak like he wants to speak to you. So many times that happens when we don't give God our attention, and you're here right now. For 90 minutes, for 90 minutes, we give God our attention right now, knowing we have things come up, but God will always honor us when we give him our attention, right? I got a sermon illustration for you today to kind of go in line with what I'm talking about. I was like, what better way to do a worship, you know, sermon illustration to actually use an instrument for it, right? This would be cool. So this, my friends, is called a guitar, right? An acoustic <laughs> An acoustic guitar, uh, and Sam is going to play. So first, did you tune it, right? Yeah. It is tuned. Okay. So it is tuned right now. I want you to play a G chord. Can you all hear that? You probably should have plugged your ear. Try it again. See how good it sounds, right? It sounds so great, don't it? Hit the E string. 
All right, now hit, actually the G is the one that sounds really bad when it yes, hit G. See, it's, you can tell that it sounds in tune, right? It just, it sounds good. Hit the G again, hit the G. Hit the full chord. It makes you want to write a song. Love that. Sounds good, right? Now, just take the G string out of tune. Good, bad. Mess that thing up. All right, now hit it. Just hit the G string. Just. And hit the G chord. Could you imagine if they didn't tune their instruments before they got up here to play worship music for you? <laughs> Guys, oh my Lord. I can hear, an, I'm a, I, I might not can sing, but I can play a lot of these instruments, and I can hear something when it's out of tune, like, almost instantly. So even when it's the slightest in tune, you can ask him. I'll be hollering at her, like, I th well, she doesn't use a guitar anymore, and these usually just, they're keyboards, so they stay in tune. It's good. Um, but I, I could hear it, like, almost instantly. It, it's great. Hit, hit it again. It's, it's... Now tune it. Tune it back. Tune it back real quick. So, on the, uh, so see, what I'm trying to get with is I think about how our lives can line up a lot like this. When we wake up in the morning, we should give God our attention. We should wake up in the morning and thank God for the day that we're about to have. We should start to put our focus on him. If you would start your day focused on him, then I believe your, your, your life, in a way, would sound like this. Right? It would sound so good. Because you started your day off right, your life is in tune with God. That's where I'm getting with this, okay? If you started off your morning getting in tune with God, and you start giving him your attention, then you're now allowing God to move in your life. You're allowing God to go forward. You're living a life of worship. But how many times that we get so busy in life that we don't even worry about that anymore, and so we wake up and we sound like this. Come on. I know somebody in here is sounding like that before, right? You, you, forgot to, you forgot to brush your teeth in the morning, right? You woke up and you forgot to kiss your wife before you left. That's a big no-no, right? You wake up, and the first person that cuts you off, you want to curse them out. <laughs> it's out of tune. It's out of tune. Man, if we would start our day off right, giving God our attention, you would start to live a lifestyle of worship, and you would understand that it comes from my heart. I've got to get my heart synced first before anything else can happen, before I can ever have something expressed from my lips, before I can ever lift my hands, before I can ever bow my knees. My heart's got to be right first. Because God said in Matthew chapter 15, can you bring that up? He said, some people, they will honor me with their lips. They will come and they will sing and they will praise us, but they don't mean it in their heart. And I vowed to make church on a mission, a place of true worshipers where we come here and when we lift our hands, it's coming from our heart. We can't wait for God to do something in our lives. We can't wait for God to do a miracle in our life. Living a life of true worship is worshiping in spirit and in truth. If I had to give you an actual term, an actual definition of true worship, I think it would be this. I think true worship is valuing or a treasuring of God above everything else. Giving him worth, value, treasuring him, giving him attention above everything else in life. That he matters. The reason you get to do what you do every day is because of him. Whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God, he's the reason constantly wanting to speak with you and guide you and lead you. So giving God our full attention, knowing that worship's not about me. Who cares if I don't like the song? Who cares what people think of, about me if I lift my hands? Who cares about any of that, man? I'm living my life of worship for him. I'm going to walk and worship with him because worship is a lifestyle. 
it's a lifestyle. And I hope that this challenges you today to number one, to stop being so picky about your worship. Stop being so picky about it. That it's got to happen on your terms when you want it to happen. And that's not the way to give God, who's number one above everything else, our full attention. You just got to realize that it happens on his terms. That we got to give it to God. I challenge you today to give him your full attention to wake up in the morning and not sound out of tune but to get your life in tune with God realizing that he wants to do a work in your life true worship gives God our full attention it gives him value and worth and treasure above all other things with everybody's head bowed and eyes closed why don't you go ahead and stand on your feet too you can go ahead and stand on your feet I want to give you a chance to respond right now because I believe some of you may want to speak to the Lord right now and I'm going to let Sam just kind of sing a, a song right now and some of you can just kind of respond right now in your heart some of you can respond in your heart right now by giving God your attention he may want to speak something into your life in this moment in this moment he can speak something into your life of me praying out these next four weeks, I'm going to leave it just like this for you to give him about two more minutes.